All right, hi guys. We're the image to LaTeX team, and uh, uh, we have been working really hard on this project for the past eight weeks, and we want to share with you guys what we have done so far. So real quick, it's our team, and uh, our team has four members, Danny, uh, Al, Alok, and myself, Kathy, and uh, those are the picture of our face. Um, and uh, real quickly, what is the objective of our project, which is, of course, using deep learning to translate an image of a mathematical equation to latex code. And here is an example. This is a picture of a mathematical equation, and here is a corresponding latex code. And I wanted to talk about a little bit why we wanted to do this project, because as a data scientist or for many researchers, we often find people um, in the need of trying to find the latex, if it's to write a paper, write a Jupyter notebook, or even answering Stack Overflow questions. So, but latex code is very daunting to start with, and a lot of people just don't want to write them. So we figure, why don't we automate this process and uh, give the time back to people, focus on what really matters to them, which is their work. So that led us to this project, and uh, continue. So the first is, of course, we need to see if we have data set. And lucky for us, this is a pro uh, problem that has been previously worked on. And uh, there is free available data set on the internet you can just download. So that gives us a head, start, a head start. And uh, here are some examples of the data set. You can see already that our training data set or images are not the same size. But that's not the only characteristics of our data set. Another thing is they're heavily pre-processed by the prior research team which turns out to be a great limitation of our model and will be discussed later in the presentation. Uh, and a few other things I wanted to stress about our data set is it's, we're essentially dealing with a very high dimensionality problem because if you think about it, there are up to 400 different syntax in LaTeX code. And uh, our model has to not only pick the right syntax, but make sure they put them into correct order. So we're talking about tens of thousands potential dimensionality as an output, and that's just add great dif difficulty strengths to our project. And with that being said, we created our base model. So what we did is um, we kind of research online and see if is there a quick and dirty way that we can just create a base model and see where that takes us to. So interestingly, we find one of the TensorFlow tutorial, which is doing very a little bit similar thing, but that is for image captioning. So basically, you know, give an image and you make a summary of it. The reason I say it's similar is because they're also using an encoder and a decoder, which is kind of the approach that we want to take. Um, so we follow that tutorial, we create our vanilla base model. What we did is we rescale our image into the same size, just for the time sake, and we create a vanilla C uh, CN encoder, and the output is being pushed into a decoder which is created by G uh, constructed by GRU layer. We also implemented Abnan, uh, Batnan, sorry, I can never pronounce that word, Batnan at, uh, style attention to our model. We made sure to overfit one batch to make sure there's no bug. And uh, uh, we got a number that is extremely close to the uh, to zero. So we thought, okay, we can train on the entire data set. And you can see that after 14 epochs of training on entire training data set, we got lost at 0.6, and we cannot get it lower. So that is the point we figure, okay, we need to really become creative and uh, figure out a way to create a model that is fitting for our own problem. So that will lead us to the architecture of the model and the results, which will be talked about by Al. All right, cool. Oops. All right, so uh, our final model architecture basically consists of three main components. Uh, the first is still a convolutional neural network that encodes the image. The only difference is it doesn't have any uh, fully connected layers. So it can handle input images that are of different sizes. And uh, the data set does have, so we don't have to have that strict pre-processing step. Um, the output of the encoder is a feature grid. And then uh, the next component of our architecture is the row encoder. And what that does is it basically applies a recurrent neural network uh, across each of the rows of that feature grid, right? And the recurrent neural networks use LSTM cells uh, to do that. And then the output of the row encoder gets fed to the final uh, key component of the model, which is a decoder. Uh, that decoder is another recurrent neural network using LSTMs uh, that also applies a Luang-style attention mechanism. And then um, at each time step, the output gets fed, fed to a fully connected softmax layer to classify the, uh, 
the latex symbol. So for the training experiments, uh, we tried a bunch of different hyperparameters listed here. Um, and then the best configuration that we were able to find was the ones highlighted in green. And since it's all mangled up, I'm going to say it was uh, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, adaptive learning rate based on the validation score after each epoch, um, the, I don't know how to pronounce her normal uh, initial, weight initialization for the convolutional layers only, and uh, an enlarged batch size of 32. OK, so uh, when we wanted to look at uh, how good our model was, uh, the first thing that we looked at was the loss, which is essentially the value of the error function that the model optimizes against during training. Uh, for this project, we used the categorical cross-entropy loss function. And for comparison reasons, that plot shows what the um, best loss of our baseline model, the one that Kathy talked about earlier, is. And also, for another comparison, uh, this is the best loss that the state-of-the-art model got. And by state-of-the-art, I'm simply referring to a previous study uh, done by an NLP group uh, at Harvard on that same data set. And this was our um, loss across different uh, training iterations on the data set. Uh, another way to look at the performance of, the, uh, of our model was through an evaluation metric. And that metric uh, is the perplexity score. We didn't come up with that. It's what the previous studies use for the, uh, the same data set. And on the bottom right corner is a table showing the, the score for our model, for the SOTA model, on both the training set and the test set. The test set is not the validation set. It's another. Never, we didn't tune the hyperparameters on that set. So once we had a model that we were happy with, we wanted to deploy it so that we could interact with it. And this is our uh, pipeline. Um, so we have a web app that uses Flask and Bootstrap. And then in the back end, we have a server um, that's Flask and TensorFlow 2.0, so our model. So we have a, a demo for you guys. Um, well, we're going we're gonna to send over this equation here. Um, and it's on YouTube. What was that? Not perfectly, but you'll see the. the Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it messes up one small. It does one small mistake if you can notice it. So okay. this is this is the website here. So we choose a file, and then we have that image that I showed. Um, convert, and then that's the LaTeX code, and uh, put that into a tech file, and then render it. Render it there. And that's the equation that it that it uh, okay, so predicted. So this is the the input and output side by side. So it did uh, pretty pretty good. Um, it did confuse a theta for a q, and then it like made the l a subscript, um, and then the also the bottom of the sigma. But it's pretty pretty good. Um, and we noticed that most of our uh, samples that we tested performed like this. But we wanted to try something more interesting. And so, we, yeah, we use this equation here. And um, what's interesting is when we fed this into the model, it only looked at the top part. It only uh, predicted that. And it did it really well. So we think, uh, we think that um, it's just because of how rigid the data set was and how it was pre-processed. Uh, so just a couple of takeaways and for the future work on this one. So yeah, I mean, the advantages for us was, well, we had an existing data set, which makes life much easier. And we had existing research to build on, uh, which also makes life easier. Uh, but still, there were challenges. The data still needed to be processed properly, and that still takes time. And also, right now, the data processing pipeline is pretty rigid for us. Uh, the second aspect, the workflow and tooling, at least for us, took a lot of time to figure out how to uh, properly establish the workflow. Um, what worked for us, uh, TensorFlow 2.0 has the subclassing API, which allows us to do multiple experiments pretty quickly in some sense. Uh, the other two, the second one, kind of obvious, but you know, throwing more compute power uh, and just spinning multiple VM instances and doing multiple experiments in parallel definitely helped. And the third part, which is like sort of surprise, was surprising to us, just increasing the batch size helped a lot. And not just that, like increasing the batch size and the initializations helped uh, quickly change the loss. 
Um, for future work, uh, what we could extend it to, well, one of them would be you know, change the encoder, which is right now just CNN, to something that's more state of the art. Uh, we would want to automate the pre-processing. So right now, it only takes you know, images where it's, the equation is sort of centered. Uh, we would want to make it more generic than that. And if that would be, uh, that I think would be a pretty cool thing to be able to do. Uh, and then finally, this just data generation and augmentation. We could, you know, uh, just from the existing data set, we could make many more equations from there. And the last part would be the Bayesian hyperparameter opti optimization. So right now, uh, we haven't been able to get to that point, but we should be. Thank you.